Hello. Today we're going to look at another event in the life of Jesus as recorded for us in the Gospel of John and it relates a time when the hostile and hypocritical leaders of the time brought to Jesus a woman caught in the act of adultery and they asked Jesus what should be done and his response is very interesting. So here it is. The woman caught in adultery and we find it in John chapter 8 verses 2 to 11. It's an amazing story of forgiveness and second chance. It arrived late in our New Testament but it got there by pure merit. It's pretty clear that this is a true story, but it was recorded in a book that didn't make it into the New Testament. Sometime around 400 AD, scribes inserted it into John's Gospel to ensure it wouldn't be lost. Different scribes put it in different places. It was also put into Luke's Gospel because his style was more like Luke's. But eventually it settled where we see it now giving a fitting illustration to Jesus' words in John chapter 8, verse 15, I judge no one. The law of Moses actually said that in the case of adultery, both the man and the woman must be put to death. We read this in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So those accusers didn't actually have any sincere concern about the law. They knew that Jesus was compassionate and forgiving, so they expected him to forgive her when they could nail him for not doing what the law said. If, on the other hand, he said, OK, stone her, they could report him to the Romans since the Jews weren't allowed to carry out capital punishment. Surely he can't escape this one, they thought. Jesus isn't normally thought of as a genius, but to me, this story shows that he was a genius. His opponents were the smartest of the smart, equivalent to university professors today. They had no doubt thought long and hard about how to trap Jesus. They carefully prepared a trap from which they thought there was no escape. They sprang it on him, giving him little or no time to think and there was no one to help him. The answer he came up with not only got him out of trouble, but it completely turned the tables on them, skewering them and their hypocrisy. I think Jesus understood their psychology too. <clears throat> they might have been tempted to lie and say, I'm sinless, but each one of them knew that if he made that claim, his colleagues would turn on them, would turn on him. A similar cunning trap of theirs which Jesus escapes with an answer of genius concerns the question of paying taxes to the emperor, which we read about in Matthew. What did Jesus write on the ground? Lots of suggestions have been made. Some old manuscripts say that he wrote down the sins of each one of them. Maybe he was just waiting for them to run out of breath. But I picture Jesus then straightening and looking at them. They go silent. Do they sense from his look that he's got them even before he speaks? And don't you like Jesus straight to the point marriage counseling? Go your way and don't sin. Anyway, it's an amazing story of forgiveness and second chance. Everyone should know this story. There are plenty of people still around today condemning others. But Jesus' love, compassion and forgiveness is still on offer, free to all. Okay, so let's begin now looking at the Greek text. And um, again, I'm going to be doing several passes over the text. The first one is where I give word-by-word -word translation. Whoops, not there. But here, underneath each Greek word I've written an English corresponding word. Or through 
de palin. Now again, parigeneto, arrive es to the temple. And kaipas holaos and all the people erget to pros auton. Kai kathisas. So kathisas, there we have one word represented by two in English. And again, edidasken, represented by these two words. He taught, the he is contained in the um, ending of the uh, verb, autus. He taught them, he or he was teaching them. The three, agusin de hoi grammatais kai hoi pharasaioi, they bring now the scribes and the Pharisees, Kunaika, a woman, Epi Moichea, Katelemenen, court. And Stesantes Autain, en meso, in middle, in the middle. Legusin Auto, Didaskale, teacher, Haute Hegune, this the woman. Of course, in English, we would just say this woman. We don't need to use this and the together. Kateleptai has been taken. Ep autoforo moikuomene. In the very act of adultery. In the tonomo hemi moses. In a telato tas. Toyatas Lithadzin. Um, in now, we say now in the law um, hour, our law, Moses commanded the like this ones. To be stoned. You then, what you say. This now they were saying, testing him, so that they have to accuse him. They have, so that they could have something to accuse him of, we would have to say in English. Now, by the way, you just notice the frequent occurrence of this word dare, um, which I often translate by now. It's not a word normally used much by John. And this is one indicator that this story uh, was not written actually by John, but was a story from somewhere else that was inserted into this gospel later to ensure that it wouldn't be lost. And here it is again. How dare Jesus katakupsas to daktulo katigraphin is gain was writing in the ground. Hos de epimenon erotontis auton, but as they were continuing um, asking him. And Nekupsin, he straightened up and said to them, Ha an amartetos human, the sinless one of you, protos epauten paleto lithon. Um, very famous, well known words that have kind of gone into the culture. Uh, he who is without sin among you is the often the way it's often translated. Uh, let him first throw the stone. Baleto, let him throw lithon. Kaipalin katakupsas, and again, having bent down, ekrafin es ten gain. He wrote on the ground. Hoide akus santes exerchonto. Heis kath heis, arxamenoi apoton presbuteron, beginning from the old ones, and katelefte monos.
Oh. Sorry about that. Katelefte monos kai hegune. He was left monos alone. Kai hegune and the woman in meso usa in the middle being. Anakupsas straightening up there now. Ho Jesus the Jesus. Epen Aute said to her, Gunai pu esin, Udes se katekrinen, No one condemns you. Notice that uh, we use here the semicolon is used uh, like a question mark. It, it just stands for a question. He de epen Udes kurie. The now said, no one, Lord. Udes, no one. Um, but we have to recognize that this is feminine. It's a feminine form of the. So uh, if we expand the translation a bit, we say, have to say now, the feminine person said, no one, Lord. Epen de Jesus, notice de occurs all the time. Ude ego nor I you condemn nor do I condemn you. For you go and so the square brackets indicate that this word is not found in some old manuscripts. Apotunun from now Literally from thy now, but in English we'd say from now on, make it no longer hamartani sin. Very interesting, very interesting. Now let's look at it a second pass, and we'll this time look at the uh, some points of the grammar, which are, are written underneath in green. So back back to verse two, parigenato. Now, just underneath here, I've put the root form of this word. It's got two parts to it. It starts with para, so the A of the para is last up here. And the second part of it, the root form is genomai. So it has this E or epsilon in Greek, it's known as at the beginning, which indicates um, past tense. This root here gives the present form. Kaipas halaos erkito. So erkito, the root form of this is erkamai, come, and it's the third person singular imperfect middle. So um, the the vowel at the beginning has changed. It, it began with an e, with an epsilon. Here, um, the epsilon appears, but here, since this word already began with an epsilon, what's happened is the uh, epsilon changes to an eta, and this ending here indicates a third person singular imperfect middle. And again, looking at this word, the uh, root form of it is Didasco and the E at the beginning, epsilon at the beginning indicates past. In this case, again, it's imperfect, which this ending shows. Third person singular, imperfect, active. So the first approximation translation for the imperfect is he was teaching, was teaching them. Um, simple past would be taught, imperfect is was teaching, but um, I suppose we could translate it the same way up here. The people were coming to him, and so that's yes, the first approximation translation for the imp and the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh, that thing jumps around. Sorry about that. Um, they bring
they bring to him a woman caught in adultery. And that word comes from kata lambano. Again, that's in two parts, kata and lambano. And we have an e there. That's this time going with a perfect. This is a perfect tense. And passive, and it's a participle. So, um, again, an, another different form of the, this verse. They say to him, Teacher, this woman, kataleptai. Again, this is katalambano. This time, oh, again, well, again, it's perfect. And passive, third person, singular. And here we come down. Um, Moses commanded once like this to be stoned. This comes from Lethadso, and it's a present infinitive. This ending, ain, is a characteristic of the present infinitive. This woman must be stoned. What do you say? This they were saying. Another imperfect with the E at the beginning and the on indicates third person plural imperfect. Now, categorin, the root form of this is categorio and it's a present infinitive. Again, we see the an ending. Um, to accuse him Kategraphin Kategrapho third person singular imperfect active and again it's got the kata at the beginning so the e for the past tense comes after that and it knocks out the uh, last vowel of the kata and the, there is the N ending for the third person singular, imperfect, active. And compare egrafen in verse 8 and edidasken verse 2. The same um, E at the beginning and N, E, N at the end. Hoste epimenon. As they remained, epimeno, third person plural, imperfect active. So the again the epsilon, the e at the beginning, indicates um, past, and the on ending is third person plural, imperfect active. Baleto comes from balo. Third person singular imperative and compare the second person imperatives that we'll come to in verse 11. Down to verse 8 for now, a graphene that comes from grapho and it's the third person singular imperfect active. Again, the same thing the e at the beginning indicates the past and the en. At the end is the third person singular and perfect active. Hoy de acusantes exer conto comes from exer homai, third person plural, imperfect middle. So again, um, it's this is x. Plus erchomai. So we have to add an e here to make it past, but the e with e changes to eta, um, and then the third person plural ending is onto. And this is actually a middle. A middle kind of stands in the middle between the active and the passive, but it doesn't have a passive meaning, it just has an active 
meaning um, they began. And you can compare Erchamai, third person singular and perfect middle, back in verse 2. Anna kupsas de ho Jesus epenaute gunai. So this ending here is evocative. So this is a vocative ending on a feminine noun compared to this, which is the vocative ending on a masculine noun. Okay, now come down to this word. This is an imperative, singular, middle, passive, and the oo ending indicates the imperative. Imperative is for a command. Go. Kai apotunun meketi hamartane. So this is another imperative ending. In this case, it's the imperative singular active. The oo ending here was for the imperative singular middle and passive, but the e ending here is for the imperative singular active. And you can compare the third person imperative in verse 7. There are two words or word parts, actually, that recur in the story and they underline the theme. They are kata and ana. Each one of these has more than one meaning and works with the word it's joined to. But the relevant parts of the meaning for us here are as follows. Kata basically means down and so uh, joined with the word for um, judge it comes to mean condemnation. I suppose it's similar in English we could say put someone down. The opposite thing is ana up and it's associated with hope and new beginning. And each of these word parts occurs several times in this story. Let, let's have a look. Jesus bends down and then straightens up twice. The first time he straightens up, it is to rout the woman's accusers. The second time, it is to set her free for a second chance. So here we are, katlemenen, so here we've got the kata bit, going with lambano, the woman was caught, um, and he, the same thing again. So this, remember, was a participle, and this is just a plain verb, caught in the very act of adultery. In our law, Moses commanded ones like these, we must stone them. What do you say? They said this to test him, to have something to um, accuse him of. So, kate got in, and here is the kata. Well, well there as well, but the, um, the A of the kata is gone. But this is kata again. And here is just kato by itself, which is another form of kata. And so he bends down. Kata kupsas. Todactylo kategrafen. So kategrafen, similar to the way in English we say write something down. Writing down, writing something in. And as they, they stayed asking him, Anakupsin, and this has ana up kupto. He, well, I suppose we could say he bends up, but of course in English we'd say he straightens up. And he says to them, the without sin one among you. Now, this is actually different from ana, um, it's a different word, it, in this, it, which means without, not having. The without sin one among you, but with the a of the um, the first word of this amartetos, it comes out to to, um, to the form ana again. So it does have that link in form, which contributes to the the up and down 
theme, the Anna and Kato theme. And in verse 8, Kato Kupsas bending down again. He bends down again. Kata lepte, so they all left, and uh, they were left. Whoop, didn't get that letter. There we go. Kata lepo, they were left, and Jesus straightened up, and he says to the woman, "Where are they? Is there no one to condemn you?" Kata krino, condemn. You. She said, No one, Lord. So Jesus said, Nor do I condemn you. And again, Kata Krino. Go and from now no longer sin. Sin no more. Okay, so the, the interesting little theme with Kata and Anno. But now we move on to our third pass which is where we look at English words that we get from these Greek words. And so here's palin, and we get the word palindrome. Here's laos, and we get the word laity. And from this word teach, we get the word didactic. Grammates, scribes, and from this we get the word grammar. Kunaika, we get the word gynecology. Meso, meaning middle, and uh, we get the word Mesopotamia, the name, uh, which actually means middle river. Now here's an interesting word, etoforo, which we translated in the very act of moikuamene, uh, adultery. And there are two parts to this word, there is auto, which um, we use auto like self auto automobile is something that is self mobile an automobile and then the second part of it is the foro and that's related to our word furtive so auto foro is like saying a self condemned thief a thief is like a furtive person it's actually comes from the Latin word for thief. Um, so furtive. Autoforo is like saying a self-condemned thief. Self-condemned because she was caught in the very act. Lithad saying so that um, we get Paleolithic, the name of a geological age. Paleo meaning old and lithic to do with stone. Kategorin. And uh, from this we get the word category. It's um, often not easy to see how a particular English word comes from a Greek word when they seem to mean very different things. But um, it, it, it often they come through Latin and, and they change on the way. But um, it, so this means accuse, categorin. They want to accuse Jesus. And a person was accused in the assembly. And so um, the, the uh, category is, um, I guess you'd say, put into a category of being accused. Dr. Lo, so writing with his finger, his finger, and we get the name of a, a um Ancient dinosaur type flying creature, pterodactyl, because it had wings on its fingers. And so we, we looked at this before the an meaning not is found in some technical words like anaerobic, uh, which refers to bacteria which do not use, do not breathe air. So aerobic air and an not not breathing air, and this means not being sinful. Uh, I think Paleolithic already said, and Protos, first, let him first cast stones upon her. Here we have this Proto as in prototype, 
the first model, the first type, the first model. A graphene graphic Presbyterian Presbyterian, the Presbyterian Church for the Elders lead. Monos um, she was left alone or just one, or well, he was left alone and, and the woman. So monotheism means the worship of one God only. We have ego, borrowed straight into English, as we talk, call it ego. Horiu, which is go, and from this we get the word poros, porous, so something that water can go through. So there we have it. What a valuable account has been preserved for us here. Pure gold, pure light, pure love.